definitely have to be a gem detective when you're trying to figure out a gem's identity because there are lots of clues that the gem provides to you. And once you have all that knowledge in your head, it's kind of a game. Mm -hmm. It's fun. So speaking of games, I have procured a little collection for you, mm. a little game. We know what these gemstones are, but we're gonna decide if they are natural or synthetic. Okay. I feel like this channel is constantly somebody stumping somebody. Absolutely. <laughs> That's all we do. Someone's always <laughs> got secrets. All right then, keep your secrets. Good. Ooh. Mm. So we have two faceted red gemstones. Uh -huh. Immediately, this larger one caught my eye because it looked to me like a synthetic. One, it's extreme clarity. Two, it has a particular color of synthetics that's pretty noticeable. And three, you can see pleochroism through the table. Absolutely, and I will say you are correct. Oh, good. Let's talk about synthetics on a very basic level. So what defines a synthetic? There's a lot of terminology in the gemological world, and you have things like imitations. Those are gems that look like each other, but may be completely different, like ruby and red spinel. So a synthetic is chemically, optically, and physically the same as its natural counterpart. So it has to have certain characteristics. By and large, synthetics have to have a natural counterpart and they have to have the same properties. Atomically, they're the same, pretty much. The main difference is the amount of time that it took to create them. So natural rubies obviously have been in the earth for quite some time and mm. went through a long, arduous process of formation. And synthetic rubies, they really don't take that long at all. Bernoulli flame fusion is probably one of the most common methods of synthetics that you'll see because it's very cost effective and it's pretty quick. Synthetics are made to imitate the best of the best of their natural counterparts. So if you could imagine a natural ruby with this much clarity at this size, it would be pretty impressive. That I would be running for the hills. <laughs> <laughs> this is a synthetic ruby. It's created by the Vernoy flame fusion process. One of the indicators you want to look for, of course, is that clarity. You want to see that pleochroism, kind of a, a purplish pink, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. If you get really close with magnification, you can sometimes see curved colored zoning in these stones. And that is like, we got a synthetic. Very that diagnostic. The, the thing you want to look at. Now, natural rubies are often very heavily included, right? Yes. They are produced via natural processes, which aren't always clean and perfect. They're kind of messy. So they're going to have mineral inclusions, crystal inclusions, like fingerprint inclusions, feathers, indicators on the inside that it's of natural form. Also, many rubies are treated and mm -hmm. you can typically detect treatment, mostly for durability reasons or color reasons. There are treatments that ruby can withstand where fractures are filled, where it's filled with certain materials so that the inclusions are kind of minimized. Let's talk about the synthetic, how Vernoy flame fusion works. R ruby is an aluminum oxide colored by chromium. And what happens is you have a hot oxyhydrogen flame that where aluminum oxide particles are vaporized. And then with the addition of chromium, these particles kind of settle onto a rotating plate and they form what's called a bull. And this bull is like a long cylindrical crystal. The layers kind of curve mm. like that. And so when it's faceted, you can detect some of that curve. You can also see air bubbles because as each consecutive layer is placed onto the bull, air is trapped and then the bubbles are formed. They're very small though. Very tiny bubbles. And so those are two primary indicators that you have mm. of Vernoy flame fusion. If it's something like a ruby, you kind of want to see what's not inside of there. If, is there 
is there no fractures in yeah. there? Are there no inclusions whatsoever? It's kind of a red flag. So That's as we such do a good point. It's made to imitate the best of the best. And so you have to use context clues sometimes mm -hmm. as well. Like I was assuming we didn't have a two million dollar ruby <laughs> on the table. I don't well... know if we've had more than that in the future. <laughs> I'm ready, Preston. I'm excited for you to see this one. Okay. Ooh. Mm -hmm. It's blue. But different shades and types of blue, yep. which is important to note because while nature creates some amazing, vibrant colors, that one on the right looks like the blue is too good to be true. It, that is, this is a textbook color for a certain material. Yes, so that to me looks like synthetic spinel. Absolutely. So that means that's a natural spinel? That's a natural blue wow. spinel, is that? Gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's amazing. I, I picked that one up and ooh. I love it. So spinel is one of my favorite materials. It's a magnesium aluminum oxide. Blue spinel is colored by iron or cobalt. And you have, again, a few different types of blue here. So this natural blue spinel has like a hint of green, but also like a grayish yeah. kind of color. It's like it's a, a muted. It's a really, really nice like moonlight type of blue, whereas this synthetic spinel oh, it's screaming. is bright <laughs> royal blue. Let's talk about different tests, because I yeah. love testing synthetic spinel. So if we take our UV light here, mm -hmm. we'll notice a bright, there is a red fluorescence there, but if we go over to the natural, none. not really see, seeing anything. So that kind of attributes to the fact that iron is in this natural spinel. Iron quenches fluorescence, whereas there's probably not any in this synthetic spinel. A lot of synthetic spin blue spinel is colored by cobalt. So a lot of you may have class rings or other type of rings that come in a lot of different colors. Maybe it was your school colors or your birthstone or something like that. A lot of those gems are actually synthetic spinel. Synthetic spinel is one of the most commonly used synthetic gemstones because again, it's easy to make, it's pretty cost effective, and you can get these beautiful colors. Spinel is also an eight on the most scale of hardness. And again, synthetic is going to have the same properties by and large. There are a few differences with synthetic spinel but the hardness is the same. So it's a fairly durable stone and you get all these pretty colors and you can make them really clean as well. So you have probably seen a lot of synthetic mm -hmm. spinel in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. All right, Rebecca, this one's a little different. Okay. That is different. A little different, a different side of the railroad oh, tracks. Oh, so pretty. So obviously we have... Pearl. Some pearl. Ah! Woo! There's a couple different tests we can do for pearl then that we don't really need to do for a crystalline gemstone. And one of those is testing the grit of the surface. So if you grab a natural pearl, and you take your tooth or your fingernail to it, and you just rub it on the outside, you will feel kind of a grittiness. Oh, that pains me. Yeah, I don't like it, it but... <laughs> it works better on my teeth than my fingernails. Same, yeah. So it's it's very gritty. To me, it's like nails on a chalkboard. It kind of is. Well, so one of the reasons why you scratch it with your fingernail or with your teeth is to understand what the surface looks like. Because in a cultured pearl or in a natural organic pearl, there's not a an evenness of how the nacre has laid mm -hmm. on the pearl, right? This is this is this an is organic process. Yes, it's a layering. There are a lot of biological things going on in that <laughs> organism. Whereas in plastic, it's an even coating. So like the coating will be smooth, but then if you look at it, it'll look like really bumpy under magnification mm -hmm. because it's it's kind of just a, a layer smacked on. Yeah. It's smooth, but the visual appearance is kind of bumpy. What is, when we talk about a synthetic pearl, what is a synthetic pearl, really. If you see a pearl that is not a natural or cultured pearl, meaning it wasn't at any time an organic being, mm -hmm. it typically is plastic. So it will have plastic and then it will have this coating. So 
Often pearls are drilled in a great way of identifying whether it's plastic or if it's natural is looking at the drill hole because typically you'll see like the plastic underneath and then the coating that they use to make that nacre, which is that iridescent mm -hmm. coating that comes from the mollusk, will kind of be, it'll sometimes be kind of like peeling away. The seed for a lot of cultured pearls is actually a Tennessee River pearl. Often what pearl farmers will do is they will put seed from other mollusks into the pearl. And then what happens is the mollusk identifies it as yes, a sort of irritant. And so then it develops this nacreous coating mm -hmm. on the outside and the time of culturing affects uh, how big how is. it is, mm -hmm. the thickness of the nacre, the shell color affects what color the pearl mm -hmm. is. Another observational feature is notice how all of these pearls are perfect. perfect. They're the same size. Whereas these, they're all a little bit different. So we got some elongated pearls. We have some pearls with, it looks like seams in the middle. Mm -hmm. They're all just unique, just ever so slight, you know, some extreme actually. And you know, the screw inside of an animal, it's not going to be perfect. Now some pearls can be pretty perfect. Yes, and that's why cult like cultured pearl necklaces of perfectly round spheres. That's why those are expensive because matching those types of pearls and getting those pearls is really difficult. Mm -hmm. Ooh, yeah. we got opal. 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 opal is one of the most difficult synthetics, differentiating natural versus synthetic. Actually, technically, synthetic opal isn't true synthetic opal from a structure stamp, or it isn't a true synthetic mm -hmm. from like being chemically, optically, and physically the same, yeah. but people call it synthetic opal. And look at the difference between I these two. I know, that's crazy. These two are just night and day. I have a very good guess, mm -hmm. but opal you really need to look under magnification to tell because it's in that structure and how it gets its play of color that it really, tells the story of its origins. What we have here is a Gilson synthetic opal. There are quite a few different processes for making opal. It's pretty much um, over the course of a few months, silica rich solution just pretty much stays still, mm -hmm. right? And that's very important for it to stay still because the opal's forming because those silica spheres are layering on top of each other. So you don't want to disturb that. And we can kind of see it. If you look through the center of the stone, you can kind of see columns sort of going across the body here. One of the indicators for natural opal is that play of color. That play of color is not going to be well-defined at all, pretty much. That play of color is going to be quite random because it was in fact randomly produced in nature. Whereas synthetic opal is made in a lab in a still solution. So you can see those layerings. One thing to look for is lizard skin and that's pretty much, it looks like lizard skin. It's very patchy. The play of color is very well defined with sharp separations in between the blues, the greens and the reds. Whereas in this Ethiopian opal, it's kind of a fuzzy separation of color. So there are some really, really high end opals. Think of like black opals with a harlequin pattern or something where you do have pretty defined sections. However, even in those, they still bleed into each other a little bit and it's not a super strict. Whereas in a synthetic, it's going to be an extremely strict separation yes. and really not a lot of bleeding and it just doesn't look right. It, that's right, this is very off. It's off. Mm. Ooh. Yeah. I'm gonna say we got some emerald here. Absolutely. I'm gonna say I have the natural. You are correct. Believe it or not, that gigantic stone is an emerald. Look at that. And it is a beautiful one. It's gorgeous. I love the cut. 
first thing off the bat, you've got lots of inclusions. Mm -hmm. Emerald is a type three clarity stone, so you should expect to have inclusions. That's due to the way that it formed. It's conducive to a lot of types of inclusions. Two phase, three phase, mm -hmm. growth tubes. It's it's called a jardin. Jardin, absolutely. This was the stone where where Claire taught me. If you're confused on whether or not it's natural or synthetic, look at what's not in there. Mm -hmm. Because natural emerald is going to have that jardin, those inclusions. Now this is Colombian emerald, so this is going to have three phase inclusions. If you don't know what that is, it's pretty much a cavity in the stone with the solid liquid and gas inside of it. It's pretty fun. You know, they'll have like maybe little fractures inside of them. And pyrite, calcite, mm -hmm. like all sorts of fun mineral inclusions. <laughs> They're also really <laughs> fragile. <laughs> so there are two types of synthetic emerald there processes. Are. Do we know what that one is? We could tell. I do. Yeah. So one thing that we can see immediately is the color of that gemstone. That is just such a vibrant, rich, deep green. It's almost got some very dark patches inside of it. Yeah. So emerald can come in multiple shades of green and usually the darker and the richer the green, the more prized it is, the more valuable it is. So there are two types of synthetic processes, primarily for emerald, hydrothermal and flux melt. This one looks to be hydrothermal. Hydrothermal has these chevron or zigzaggy lines. It creates like somewhat of a haze. Flux yeah. has a lot of flux material, which can really imitate some natural inclusion. So I find flux emeralds to be one of the more mm -hmm. difficult. So flux melt stones often have what's called wispy veil inclusions. And but it does when you hold it up to a natural em emerald, it there is a difference. You know, emeralds got multiple different things, whereas these flux emeralds just have those wispy those, veils. Yeah. Flux emeralds also tend to have bits of platinum in them as well because they're made in a crucible. But again, sometimes that's confusing because mm -hmm. emerald can have inclusions like other mineral yeah. inclusions or pyrite inclusions, like other metallic inclusions. So it's really important to know what certain inclusions look like. They have typical shapes and lusters and positions. And so, so this is really fun, Preston. It was, do you feel like a gem detective? Yes, yes. <laughs> and this, you know, this is one of my favorite parts about gemology because you just get to know each stone like so personally mm -hmm. and synthetics have their place in the market. Natural stones have their place in the market. There's something for everyone, really. If you have any more questions on whether or not stones are natural or synthetic, just let us know in the comments. Yes, let us know if you have any questions about these or any other gemstones. We love to be gem detectives with you guys. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any of our future videos. See you next time.